Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. And uh, uh, while people are um, enrolling, uh, subscribing, uh, and entering our uh, Skype uh, uh, lecture collaboration for today, I will once again make a short introduction for Mr. Uh, and Dr. Thomas Siegmer, who is born 1962 in Potsdam, and he lives and works in Berlin. Uh, Thomas Irmer is a Berlin-based scholar, dramaturg and critic, regularly contributing to Theater the Zeit uh, German uh, magazine, then Maska Slovenian magazine, uh, the Scalia Polish magazine for theater, and the Shakespeare uh, Norwegian uh, uh, theater magazine. Mm -hmm. He has also worked for various international festivals from 2003 till 2006 as a dramaturg uh, for uh, Spielzeit Europa, Berliner Festspiele, then uh, theater festival Borsnikovo Srećanje Maribor Slovenia. Uh, his recent books include Andrzej Wirt, Fluchnacht Worn from 2013, then Maria Steinfeld, Das Bild des Theaters 2015, then the book Kastorf from 2016, and Parseval from 2019. He is a member of ITI Germany. He has a very rich academic and professional career, and it is interesting, and once again I would like to read that he is also author and co-director of four documentary films on theatre. From 2003, it's a production, the Bunen Republic, theater in, theater in the GDR. Uh, then from 2004, it's Europe in Pieces, new drama for Europe. Uh, the third film from 2008 is Born 1968, Theater artists look back to their careers. And uh, documentary film Heiner Müller, a biographical portrait uh, production from 2009. So, Thomas, thank you very much for being our guest, collaborator, lecturer. And uh, the title of today's lecture is um, The Unknown Present, uh, Contemporary German Drama in Context. You're welcome, please. Yes, thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Uh, behind your or in front of your screens. Thank you for the introduction, of which maybe the making is important. As I sent uh, to all of you these uh, fragments of films about four uh, major productions of German theater, of contemporary German theater. So you may watch this as we go, or you may watch this uh, later on as we you know, speak about it. And uh, the unknown present, of course, is a title that uh, is self-explicatory in a way that new drama explores what we don't know about ourselves, about our present, therefore unknown present. So new drama can be seen as a backbone of theater uh, and likewise its battlefield as it is seen as problematic. I know you are from different countries, from different theater cultures. Uh, so, but in general, people like to see classics or new versions of the classics. And <clears throat> new drama is often disputed as something uh, minor, and maybe not so important. And of course, but nevertheless, uh, in order to go on with theater culture, we need new drama. And also, uh, new drama is like uh, our contemporaries speaking about our world, and, and therefore I think it's very, very important and should not be underestimated. Uh, with about 100 new plays each season in the German-speaking countries, which is like uh, next to Germany, uh, German-speaking Switzerland, and Austria, so we see that as a unit in terms of literature, uh, or also in terms of new drama. And you will see why, because uh, the Austrian contribution is much bigger, is a much greater share than, let's say, uh, from other regions of Germany, and which has to do with their own tradition of Austrian drama. But, however, these uh, the new 100 new plays each season, they make uh, uh, a field of new drama and which needs a survey between traditions and actual discourse in the context of uh, what you probably all know as post-traumatic writing uh, after the uh, 
term that was coined by Andrzej Wirth, but later on it was written as a book by Hans Dietz Lehmann, but the, uh, the term was invented by Andrzej Wirth, and Ivanka mentioned <coughs> one of my books that I made with Andrzej, and it uh, can be traced back to this uh, uh, teaching by Andrzej Wirth in New York in the early 70s. Uh, by the way, uh, this is like a digression that makes circles. I will go on like this. Uh, like what we are waiting for is the new play by Peter Handke. And uh, so I will give you some of the names like this. Yes, so you can see this. And uh, uh, yes, so the po whole post-traumatic uh, discourse, as we know it for a new drama, started with Peter Handke offending the audience in 1966. And then Andre Wood picked up on that and made the, the first theory of post-traumatic writing. And this season in Salzburg, and yesterday I was speaking about the Salzburg Festival, uh, we will have the next new play by Peter Handke in this summer. Despite all the corona crisis, it probably will be premiered uh, as scheduled. So what I'm talking today about is uh, like the mostly the writing after Heiner Müller, who died in 1995, who saw a landmark in German drama, and next to Elfriede Jelinek, the Nobel Prize winner, and Peter Handke, uh, the other Nobel Prize laureate in drama. Yeah. So here you already see the situation, maybe for the Austrian uh, literature and theatre, that. Uh, with Jelinek and Handke, you have two uh, writers who contributed with uh, a unique style of new drama uh, to the contemporary German-speaking uh, theater. But I will focus also upon the what we now call the millennial generation that has entered the field and is represented by playwrights like uh, Dirk Lauke, who is like a, like a newcomer. Yes, yeah, so I hear the name Dirk Lauke, so you see this. Uh, and, but I will return to him later on. And, but to give you one more uh, name uh, that we're waiting for, that may be not so familiar to you, it's, uh, he is as prominent as maybe Hanke is uh, Rainer Götz, and he will have a new will, will have a new play, uh, Reich des Todes, Realm of Death, and that will open the season in Hamburg in September. And Rainer Götz is one of the um, very experimental, uh, but also uh, writing with historical consciousness. He's one of the most important playwrights uh, in Germany even though he hasn't written a new play in 20 years. So this is the first one after 20 years. So check it out. I want uh, to turn your interest to these uh, names and, and to find more later on, and also like to watch uh, what I gave you as video. And so, that, but there's also some practical information that I will start with. Uh, as you all come from very different countries and uh, uh, a basic question is like how the new play gets into the world, who discovers it and how. And quite often you, we have like the something like the Anglo-Saxon model, which is uh, like a uh, playwright has an agent and the agent takes care of all the business. Yeah, they, they, but we don't have the agent culture, uh, no culture of agents, but we have special departments of the major publishing houses that will present the work and interests of playwrights. Yeah, there are like three major agencies of like that that can be seen as special enterprises on the top of in this field. And I think more than ninety-five percent of all new plays professionally produced are in the hands of those special departments and drama. So we don't have the individual agent who sells maybe your work to some theater or, or give channels to some director, but we have these agencies 
as part of major publishing houses. That makes a big difference uh, in the German culture of theater. And basically, there is no way around them. Yeah? Uh, they handle the business with the theaters. They copy edit the play text, advertise new work, do most of the PR work, and are helpful consultants to the playwright. That's an indispensable service. Hence, almost nothing else exists outside this system. Yeah? No self-publishing or website propaganda has ever brought a new playwright on the stage in Germany. Yeah? It's basically impossible, uh, which is you know, maybe also the limitations of a, of a professionalized system. But I think talent uh, won't go undiscovered here. This might be a conservative gatekeeper, but this channeling overall guarantees professional quality. Talents are, as I said, discovered and developed. The people in these departments are also often like scouts to find them. Yeah, sometimes people are uh, also discovered uh, through their prose writing, or they had first an interesting radio play, which is also so some relevant culture here. Uh, but uh, to make it as a playwright, uh, usually you would work with these uh, publishing agencies. Another aspect is certainly the question of education. Since the early 90s, we have graduate programs for playwrights. Uh, the first one was established at the Berlin University of Arts. One of the first professor actually indeed was uh, Heiner Müller, yeah, like who, who taught young playwrights. Uh, one of the students was Dea Loa, who might be known to some of you. Uh, so there was uh, also a sort of uh, an institutionalized uh, way of uh, teaching playwriting. Uh, but it's not as long as it is in the United States, for example, but it's relatively new in a way that it uh, started only in the 90s. Uh, this might seem odd, but reflects the understanding of how playwriting has been created in German culture for centuries, uh, because as a genuine work of literature, uh, the German understanding quite often is so that it cannot be taught in formula otherwise. So there's not a a method just to how to write a play or how to write a good play and so on. So there's still some debate about this, whether you can really teach playwriting. I think one can teach uh, the basics and, and maybe the foundations of understanding uh, playwriting, but of course the sort of the individual uh, creativity is nothing that comes from the classroom. But we have today such classes and workshops in all three German-speaking countries. There are also uh, initiatives like this in Austria and in Switzerland. And uh, to some extent, this has uh, also contributed to the quality of new drama in uh, Germany uh, or in German literature. Uh, what I, as I said, like the title is uh, The Unknown Present. The Unknown Present is also kind of a, 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 like a trap door, yeah, because it already signals uh, that the new drama is mainly about the present. Yeah? Of course, you know that there used to be historical drama and all kinds of things. Uh, uh, that are not only related to the present uh, in terms of material and topics, but uh, uh, the, I think like, and this is the case for most of new drama in almost all literatures or all theater cultures, is that new drama is mainly concerned with the present. And I think that uh, maybe an a situation that needs to be rethought, that needs some rethinking. Yeah? Uh, as Heiner Müller, uh, that I will refer to here and there, 
he stated in an interview in 1990, and you know that was like the time when, you know, uh, of great historical change, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and in the process of German reunification and change in the world, uh, he stated what happens now is the total occupation of the present by only the present. Ja, was jetzt passiert, ist die totale Besetzung mit Gegenwart, which means uh, all we think about the present will be in the present and will be with the present. And he uh, said that as a very, very critical uh, condition. Ja? So that the unknown present is one issue, but also that it's only the present, uh, present is the other issue. The pressures of the past and visions of the future may be deleted altogether. Yeah? So this is like this total occupation uh, of the present by only the present. No past, no future. And I wonder whether this may change a little bit with this current corona crisis. Yeah? That our thinking of uh, uh, what is our present could change for literature. Yeah, for your individual life, it may be something else, but for literature, of course, it's a very interesting question for drama. And, you know, probably uh, or you might remember this uh, Francis Fukuyama, this uh, American historian who uh, made the famous error about the end of history uh, in 1990. He said, like, with the end of the Cold War, it's also the end of history. The West has won and so on, but uh, he was so wrong. I, I wonder how somebody like this can be still a professor who made one of the greatest mistakes in uh, human thinking. In a strange way, this can be applied to new drama. And this is uh, uh, one of my points. Uh, it means, on the other hand, also a total freedom in relation to the present world. Yeah? So there is, of course, not one concept to understand the present, but there are like a, a total, a totality of many, many, many approaches to the present world, whereby Shakespeare, for instance, didn't set a single play in his own present, yet his plays speak about the political conditions of his own world. And before I come to show you some examples of this, uh, I want to remind you of what we have as uh, typical types of plays yeah, uh, that come from ancient Greek culture to our present days. Yeah. So we, for, ex for instance, we know the in reinterpretation of myth in the tradition of ancient drama. I think there is very little in contemporary playwriting that still relates to this uh, tradition of reinterpretation of myth. There is some here and there, but in general, it's not uh, a, a sort of mode of playwriting anymore. Then we know historical plays about decisive moments in history that I could name from the German tradition like Büchner's Danton's death as it is uh, about the French Revolution as it is known in very many countries. Uh, so the historical plays uh, as we know them are also rather absent from the contemporary stage. Yeah? Then we know parable plays like the ones from Brecht or from the Absurdist to capture abstraction of human behavior uh, applied to social conflict. Also, we have very little of that. Uh, so this tradition has also almost dried up. Yeah? So reinterpretation of myth, historical plays, uh, then parable plays, uh, that has come almost to an end, I believe. And then we also know fantasy fairy tales for the stage that reflect the problems of our real societies and social realities. That's maybe the Harry Potter style of uh, you play, uh, but I think it's also not a very interesting and dominant 
mode. As I said, all these models of dramaturgy are almost completely absent in contemporary German drama. Instead, we have the occupation of the present in new drama. And uh, I'm aware that I employ myself in this perspective like an ethnologist of drama. Yeah, so I look at it like uh, if I were like an ethnological researcher. Uh, because I find it very strange that we have a tradition of new drama that is only about our contemporary, about our present. Why would playwrights write only about their present world? They always do, but for the very sake of their audience, it must be said, uh, they do that. And but But now we have like a lack of translation yeah, in our uh, drama culture. In, in former times, people knew uh, how to translate historical events into their present, uh, for example, but we don't need to do that anymore. So in order to explore uh, the present, we don't need the historical detours. And one could also say, like uh, on the other hand, the present has become so complicated that it's even uh, too difficult to use such detours. Yeah? So you, that makes the pressure to work on the very present now and here uh, with new drama. And this is like my first thesis, the present is unknown. Yeah? The present is unknown. With every single day we encounter an unknown present, and especially now, and I think therefore the contemporary drama uh, wants to devote itself to the unknown present, and, and not the past or maybe the uh, visionary future and so on. So this is uh, the problem of that very issue. Yeah? And uh, also, like with what is special for the German situation is that it's not only uh, for the individual playwright, but we also have uh, this as a matter of, uh, you know, theater makers that are at the same time authors, yeah? directors becoming authors, or you have troops like Rimini Protocol, they are their own authors. They don't do uh, dramatic work from other writers. They do the, only their own work. They follow their own path. So that's also part of that whole field that I uh, enlarge this as a sort of uh, the auteur director. It's a strange term. Yeah? So it's like the, the theater director who makes uh, his or her own drama for their purposes. Yeah, and this is like what we see in practice. Uh, as I mentioned, Rimini Protocol, and I'm sure most of you have seen at least one show, uh, uh, I want to speak a little bit about Rimini Protocol and what they represent. So, of course, in, in the larger context, uh, Rimini Protocol, uh, are in the lineage of documentary theater. Yeah? The, and the documentary theater is still one of the most important trends in contemporary German theater, which has to do a little bit with the specific traditions. And uh, you have uh, one of the four video clips I gave you is from the latest show by Remini Protocol, which is called 100% Berlin, and which is a sort of demographic uh, uh, theater. Demographic theater is about the, uh, the statistics of population in Berlin. They have done it in very many other cities as well, in Paris and in Boston and in uh, many cities in, in Russia. Uh, uh, it's one of their models that they have created 
but it can be traced back to the traditions of documentary theater. Documentary theater uh, started in the 1920s and is then related to the names of Erwin Piscator, the director, who was also one of the directors of Berlin Volksbühne, and the emergence of political theater as documentary theater. Then the next great step was uh, in the 1960s with the advent of Rolf Hochhut. I think you can see the name. Rolf Hochhut, and uh, who made uh, the, one of the most important most important plays uh, from 1963 was the the, the deputy. Yeah. And Hoho died only four weeks ago, and I this uh, should be the occasion to remember him with a few more words, uh, uh, because it is Hoho is so important for uh, what the documentary theater became in Germany, but also in many other countries as well. Yeah. So as as I said, the Hoho born in 1931. He died only four weeks ago, age 89, and uh, that's uh, one of the major figures for this whole phenomenon of documentary theater. It started in 1959, yeah, remember, 1959, when the young, very young Rolf Hochhut, uh, who was working as an editor for the Bertelsmann Book Club, uh, he went to Rome to research the diplomacy of the Vatican during World War II, and more precisely the role of the Pope, Pius XII, during the Holocaust. What you already have here with this play uh, that came from this research, the deputy, der Stellvertreter, sometimes also translated as the representative, uh, it's re referring to the deputy of God on Earth and addressed the scandalous reluctance of the Vatican to protest the deportation of Jews into extermination camps. The text of the deputy consisted not only of the play with fictitious characters based on real people, one important element of this documentary drama, uh, and their dialogues of these uh, fictitious characters, but also included documents that would prove the historical issue at stake. That is one important element of what critics and scholars later defined as documentary theater, while Hochhut himself has always preferred to call this political theater. And I think this is, uh, just to take this, is uh, very important to understand also the poetics of the present or the pressure of the present. So what the Hochhu did with the deputy was like researching the recent past. Yeah? And that's a difference to what is researching our immediate present. So this documentary theater of the 1960s, the documentary drama of the 1960s, was mainly concerned with the recent past, which was, of course, uh, the era of fascism, and sometimes also Stalinism. And uh, uh, so they were uh, confronting their contemporary audience with the past. But coming out of this is uh, like this uh, serious method how to research uh, in documentary style for contemporary drama. And this is a legacy that came uh, on to the creators of contemporary documentary theater like Remini Protocol, like Milo Rao, and most of all, that's maybe a name that is not so familiar to you, Hans Werner Krösinger, who, by the way, also worked in uh, former Yugoslavia when he made a, a research play about Sarajevo and the origins of the First World War. So, but these people uh, 
the, these creators of the new documentary theater all, despite all differences, much to the tradition coming from Hochhut, the theatrical researcher with political alertness. And this is like the book, uh, Hochhut made a, a wonderful book of lectures. I hope you can see it uh, like this. It says, uh, the birth of tragedy from war. Yeah? It's like, like from Nietzsche, the birth of tragedy from the spirits of music. Uh, but this is the birth of tragedy from war. And he was very serious about that. I don't know if you can, uh, if it's available in other languages, but to understand what the uh, uh, documentary theater can be, I recommend this book. It's almost as important as maybe uh, Keith Lehmann's uh, uh, post traumatic theater uh, for this field of documentary theater. And uh, uh, Yes, maybe we can discuss later on, or you have questions about that. Uh, but I would take this as the one example from the 1960s, Hochhut, uh, and uh, for the tradition of documentary theater. So. <clears throat> Uh, but, of course, there are other trends, other streams of drama in uh, our contemporary world. And I gave you another video clip uh, uh, that's called uh, The Asylum Seekers and from Thalia Theater in Hamburg. It's a play by Elfriede Jelinek uh, to have this example. So Jelinek wrote a play uh, based on the ancient Greek uh, drama. And so it's a sort of a, one of the rare examples of a reinterpretation of ancient Greek drama. Uh, but it is on the issues of refugees in contemporary Europe. Yeah? And this was staged in 2015 in Hamburg with real refugees on stage by Nicolas Stemann. The as asylum seekers with real African refugees, you see that in the film. Uh, some of them uh, give statements. Yeah? They were very proud be, uh, uh, to be in that production. But on the other hand, they were almost silenced as they had no real text. Yeah? So <laughs> there was a, a big discussion uh, about that, that they were just uh, like decoration on stage. Yeah? So, of course, the theater demonstrated we are here uh, uh, to demonstrate for the asylum seekers, for the refugees, but uh, on the other hand, it was only the professional actors who would speak uh, Yelinek's text. And that made it very uneven and maybe even also unjust in terms of uh, how theater works. And uh, it triggered a discussion about how to deal with this issue of uh, refugees, as it is one of the greatest uh, phenomena in contemporary Europe. Yeah, And especially, as you know, German, Germany speaks uh, Germany played an important role in that, especially in the year 2015, when this theater production was made, uh, when they opened the border for uh, 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 what people say about one million people uh, of refugees coming into the country. So this is one very important example how new drama, in the words of Jelinek, uh, came on the stage to a very topical issue like uh, the asylum seekers. Then the next uh, example that you have in video is Wolfram Lott, uh, the, the Lächerliche Finsternis, the Ridiculous Darkness, a wonderful production from Burgtheater in Vienna. And Wolfram Lott's 
represents like this new generation of playwrights. Yeah, so they were born in the 1980s, uh, so which means they are so under 40 today, and they uh, grew up and they learned, uh, you know, how to use the post-traumatic forms. They were quite natural to them. Yeah. Uh, and how to use these post-traumatic forms within one play with current issues. So one of the issue of the Lächerliche Finsternis is like German troops abroad, post-colonial topics, which make uh, another great issue uh, of current debates. Yeah, the whole issue of post-colonialism also has reached now German culture, and I will give you another example for this later. And uh, but, however, what you see in uh, Wolfram Lotz in this uh, staging of his Thomas, we can't hear you. Thomas, we can't hear you. Please unmute. Thomas, please unmute uh, your microphone. Oh. Okay. okay now. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Sorry. So I lost you in the course of Wolfram Lotz and the ridiculous darkness. Okay. So please watch this. And I also gave you in German this monologue, the politiker, the politicians. Uh, uh, that, that's another good example uh, because it combines several elements of new drama, like the absurdist rhetoric uh, that also reflects post traumatic position of this monologue because it's a monologue without subject who's speaking yeah and this uh, represents this new generation uh, next to uh, Ferdinand Schmalz so this is another name you should be aware of and uh, Dirk Lauke with whom I will speak about later so as I already mentioned this uh, that the ridiculous darkness is also addressing topics of the post-colonial situation uh, and there is also one good example that i choose for you and those are the uh, fragments that you get to watch from frank castor faust yeah like one element is like one of the four videos i give you was from Volksbühne Frank Kastorf Faust uh, and from 2017. So why is this important? Of course, first of all, it's a classical play by Goethe, everyone knows, uh, but it's one of the most radical reinterpretations of this classical text with contemporary issues because uh, Kastorf's version is based on this post-colonial research and historical re-examinations in German and French culture. And this, I mean, now it's uh, three years old, but the, this is the most uh, uh, controversial topic at the moment in, in Germany. So it's, it's a post-colonial uh, thing. And you already have that in, in, in this production and also in the video I gave you because you see uh, like one French rapper, the Traoré, yeah, in the 
Paris Metro, this black guy in the Paris Metro, and he's reciting one of, of the most famous poems on the Holocaust, yeah, Paul Celan's Fugue of Death. Yeah. And to bring this together, the post-colonial and the post-Holocaust, so to speak, uh, has become one of the most controversial issues right now. So, and uh, somehow, uh, of course, this is not in Goethe, and in a way, uh, Frank Kastorf has created a new play, a new Faust, with this, uh, with his typical montage of other texts. Yeah, and there is also like uh, uh, from the decolonization Frank Fanon in this. Yeah, so you see, uh, is that the the right way? Can, can you read this? Yes. Um, so, um, Fanon, on one hand, and Paul, the poetry of Paul Celan, yeah, uh, this is uh, in combination, uh, this represents like one of the most controversial issues, and uh, it's like a new play with this old South. And it's a very contemporary play, as we know, so we could see Wolfram Lotz uh, with the ridiculous darkness is, you know, a genuine new playwright, but also Frank Kastorf is a playwright in his own right yeah, with this uh, montage uh, to, to treat a similar issue like Lotz did. Like, of course, with Lotz we see a new play, with Kastorf it is based on the staging, but nevertheless how he treats the material makes it a new play, this Faust of 2017, and we deal with the reverberations at the moment, you know, with uh, how the uh, Holocaust and the post-colonial situation are intertwined. So this has really become a big debate at the moment. Uh, to make a short interruption and to, to give you just some inter uh, some recommendation. Maybe you ask yourself or you ask myself, uh, are there plays that would deal with the current corona crisis? <laughs> of course, there are no plays ready yet. Yeah, but I found one interesting monologue by the playwright Albert Ostermeyer. So he's of the generation born in the late 60s and uh, who came up in the late 90s with the first wave of new drama in the, you know, and Albert Ostermeyer, he wrote one monologue and the monologue is called Erega. Yeah, so it's like Erega, English translation would be pathogen or pathogen. Yeah. And it's like a, uh, the monologue of a you know kind of manager, a top manager in this globalized world, who is infected by an unknown pandemic. Yeah? So in a way, this monologue brings together uh, the globalized capitalism with this kind of unknown pandemic. Maybe you check it out. It's easy to make, yeah, so you need, I think you need a very interesting actor <laughs> to, to play this, but it's something almost like the reality on stage, as we want to have it with our unknown presence, yes. <laughs> so Albert Ostermeyer, Arega, could be one recommendation. But the playwright, uh, who was maybe the the best in the last five years uh, is uh, Ferdinand Schmalz. It's a Aust young Austrian playwright. Yeah? And again, what you can see as a phenomenon is that uh, Schmalz is able to combine the tradition of the post dramatic, which is like sort of experimental writing, with social issues social issues of neoliberal capitalism and the specific tradition 
of treating language in a special way as it is uh, common for the Austrian tradition, only for the Austrian tradition. Yeah? So you have that with Hanke and Jelinek. Their plays are also concerned with language issues. And you have this, then you had Werner Schwab in the 90s, and now you have like Ferdinand Schmalz. And I think Ferdinand Schmalz is maybe the most important young playwright uh, in the German speaking country. And uh, uh, I really recommend to deal with his work because uh, one can say that Ferdinand Schmalz has fused, has you know, merged together uh, the best traditions of German speaking drama of the last 50 years, which means like the political concerns, like uh, the Hochhut used to have yeah, with the language tradition that is represented maybe by Peter Handke and Jelinek, along with the, uh, the search for the new in our contemporary present. Therefore, I would single out Ferdinand Schmalz as an outstanding figure in contemporary drama. But I have one more example for you before we close this session, and I wait for your questions. Uh, this is uh, Dirk Lauke, again, a very young man, uh, uh, born in 1982 in East Germany, so he still had some share of this growing up in this socialist country, and, but is very productive. Uh, more than 30 plays up to date, and uh, he represents, in a way, the uh, category of social drama, social drama un under uh, the conditions of today. Yeah? So he writes about, you know, usually young people in uh, simple jobs, yeah? so it's like the lower middle class, or maybe even the, actually the precariat, yeah? so of what, what we have today, and most of his characters are uh, below the lower middle class, and they struggle uh, to make ends meet in their life, and uh, this is also the tradition, if you want to have a tradition for that, of course there's one share of Brecht, there's one share of Horvath, yeah, Uden von Horvath, 1920s, 1930s, you know, it's also like the Casimir and Carolina, this kind of milieu, uh, and then there is one share of Franz Laffer Kurt, who started writing uh, plays about especially people in the countryside or in small towns in the 1970s, and uh, Lauke has picked up on that tradition, and I find him very interesting uh, for the whole field of new social drama. Yeah? Uh, he has characters like, uh, like one guy is like, uh, makes money, he, he bought a tank from the old East German army, yeah? and um, makes tours with this tank. And so people pay to, just to have a fun ride with this tank. Yeah? And here you have something like a, a, a symbol for his role. Yeah? So it's, people are poor. They, it's not a real job you know, to rent out a tank for fun rides, uh, but this guy has to make some money. And on the other hand, the tank itself is a symbol the tank was important in the Cold War and, you know, in some military uh, conflict, but today the tank is obsolete and uh, is used for these sun rides. And uh, uh, this is what Lauke's issue are. People under pressure in an age of, you know, enormous gentrification, enormous neoliberalism, like the losers of neoliberalism, this uh, is the world of his new social drama. Uh, like the latest play 
it was called, it has the title, Nur das Beste, only the best, yeah? and it could not be staged anymore because of Corona. It was supposed to be staged in Freiburg, and it has a, a motto. The motto of the former Chancellor Helmut Kohl, the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who was like from the early 80s to the late 90s, he was Chancellor of Germany. And he indeed stated at one point... Uh, Thomas, you can you hear me? Yes. What is it? Can you hear me? Poverty conditions might be uh, unknown to them, and therefore I think just to also include uh, this into this uh, unknown present. So that's uh, about an hour, and I'm waiting for your questions. Maybe we we'll take more time for, for your questions than mm -hmm. to go on lecturing here. Yes, uh, Thomas, thank you very yes. much. I uh, would like first to share with you two questions from tomorrow. One is by uh, okay. Jaja, and the second oh, is by uh -huh. Say again, please. Uh, I have to, uh, first, can we start this Q&A yes. session with two questions from tomorrow? Um, uh, from uh, Sorry, from yesterday. Uh, I, I just you. missed to notice them on time, and I'm sharing uh, them with you. The first one is by Jaja. Uh, she's saying thank you for the informative lecture. My question, you. can you hear me? didn't get it. Oh, my God. Can you hear me now? Now, yes. Yes, okay. So, uh, the first question is relate, related to tourism in theater. How does theater artists see the pandemic and how this pandemic will affect the tourism in theater? Do you think that the, this pandemic will give more innovative ways to a theater and culture exchange across the countries? Mm -hmm. uh, did I get it right? Tourism? Yes, tourism. She what wrote tourism. Mean? I don't understand. What, what is meant by tourism and theater? Uh, maybe opportunity to go abroad to see new uh, performances yeah, by yeah. foreign colleagues. Maybe co-production as a sort of uh, theater okay. tourism. Can you hear me? In and out. So off and on. But I didn't get the whole what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I will skip this one uh, and return later. Uh, Natasha is asking, I'm also interested about one other German theater and filmmaker, uh, uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder and yes. his amphitheater. What can mm -hmm. you say about that and his influence? Well, the, there is a phenomenon that uh, Fassbinder's movies have often been adapted on the stage and quite uh, successfully and with amazing results. So Fassbinder can be seen almost as a contemporary playwright, but mostly for his films, yeah? not so much for the plays that he wrote when he was with Anti-Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would consider Fassbinder uh, as a very special case that he is one of our contemporaries uh, in playwriting, <laughs> For with his movies, even though he is now almost 40 years, he's dead. Yes, but he is a contemporary playwright because many issues he addressed in his films, like uh, like the the immigrant workers, uh, uh, outsiders, uh, homosexuality, uh, you know the conservative structures of society, and I think. Fassbinder is really uh, a contemporary. Yes, he has been revived. Yes, he has been revived. Uh, please mute your microphones. I cannot hear uh, the lecture. Thank you. Okay, next question. Question is Marius um, uh, Martin. Marius von Meinburg, uh, yes? Yeah? But are not staged in our country. Do they stage them often in Germany? Or, and in what group would you group them? Uh, well, 
mine book started like 20 years ago with this fireface. Yeah. Uh, and that was very important for as, as then he was seen as the, the new brutalisti. Yeah. So the novi, novi brutalisti, these people who were in the lineage of Sarah Kane uh, and Mark Ravenhill shopping and fucking in the beginning. Now I think he is somewhere else. He's mm -hmm. so experimenting with social drama, but also comedy and things like that. But uh, in the last 10 years, maybe uh, his plays were not recognized uh, in such, with such an international attention anymore. But there is one film, Russian film by Kirill Serebrennikov based on mein book. The German title is Martyr. Yeah, and the Russian title is Uchenik. Uchenik. And watch this film. It's about religion today. And there you see that uh, mein book is so very important as a playwright to deal with contemporary problems. Yeah? Uchenik, Martyr, and the, the film has the, sometimes the title, the, 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 the boy who reads the signs. Yeah, so I think like it's confusing about the titles, but it's based on a play by Man, mein book. It's mature, uh, like the mature materiology. Uh, and uh, this is a very interesting play where you see that religion can become one of our fundamental problems in society. And uh, mein book made a wonderful play but I think uh, Serebrenikov, yeah, who transposed the play into Russian, contemporary Russia, yeah, uh, made the play even stronger. Yeah? This is my recommendation. And so mein book still belongs to the important playwrights uh, in Germany. Next question. Um, Yes. Uh, um, okay. Do you think that the current theater is kind of empty, has nothing to say, just form? I can't hear you. You're, you're... Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Thomas? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. uh, do you think that the current theater is kind of empty, has nothing to say, just form, current theater? Okay, please repeat. Or maybe change your microphone. I, I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, do you think that the current current cannot be just form? I I didn't get the whole. So what was it? Like, uh -huh. hmm? Okay. Uh, next question. According to Fassbinder Santi Theater, what exactly? Just a moment. Um, I lost. Uh, just a moment. According to Fassbinder Santi Theater, what exactly anti-drama means in German contemporary drama? Oh, I think we don't have uh, a situation for anti-drama. You know, the anti-drama uh, was necessary in the 1960s. People like Fassbinder and also the young Kurtz and uh, also Wolfgang Bauer in Austria, and also even Peter Handke with his first play, Offending the Audience, they were, they were trying to destroy the conventional drama. Yeah? And it was necessary to destroy it, you know, to make something different. I think the situation in theater and culture today, there is no need to destroy drama anymore. We have <laughs> a, a tradition of 50 years of deconstructing uh, conventional drama, uh, there is no need of anti-drama anymore. There is no need of anti-theater. Rather, we have to reconstitute theater. Yeah? So we are, if you, if you like, uh, it's more like a conservative period of reconstitution. But why would we need to destroy drama? But I gave you the example uh, of Frank Kastorf. That's something else. It's like a 
a remontage, a recombination of, of text for new purposes. So this is maybe our anti-drama, so to speak. Yeah? His Faust might be seen as anti-Faust, but it is not destroying Faust. It's making a radical new reinterpretation with, with new, uh, new collage of text. And maybe this is uh, uh, the parallel to what we had in the 1960s with anti-drama and anti-theater. But, uh, you know, uh, I remember, or uh, I met uh, Handke and I met Wolfgang Bauer, and they recalled, yes, back then we wanted to destroy theater. We wanted to destroy drama. Yeah, uh, But I don't think that's the position for today. Yeah, So we have, maybe let's put it in a positive way, we live in an area of recombination and not of destruction. Okay. I agree. I agree. I agree. Oh. Okay. There's some, some uh, how would you define role simulating theater? Simulating theater. How would you define role how would you define theater? Role simulating theater. I didn't get the term. What kind of theater? Uh, uh, uh place how would made I define by Roland, uh, uh, made made by Roland Schimpf Schimpf in place. place? How would you define it? Okay, that's getting complicated. Can you write it down? Like can't discuss by language or research or corona? Uh, what say again? Roland Schimmel finish. Oh Schimmel finish. Okay. Well uh, to be frank, uh, he is not one of my favorites, but uh, he's of course very clever, and he's, he was very clever in developing playful dramaturgy. Yeah, but on the content side, it was not so deep. Yeah, he has uh, written like the Golden Dragon about the Chinese cook. Uh, one of his best plays is the Arabian Night, which fuses uh, sort of uh, Oriental mythology with contemporary German world and so he can be very good but I think uh, as a playwright he was not uh, creating new impulses for the whole genre. Uh, I don't I don't understand Euphonia. 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 Okay I think many people have their mics open so I get a lot of uh, you know, so strange sounds like your feedback, and I cannot hear you. I, I just yes. Okay, uh, please, uh, everybody, everybody mute your, your uh, microphone and just, just chat in your, your questions. questions. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Okay, Ivanka, are you with me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, could, uh, you could you enlighten us, us on the performance, performance space? space? and body as a category in the context of this theater of the present by demon okay that's, this is a question sound problem so with us so i have i hear echoes and delays and things like that uh i cannot really make it out what you are saying mm -hmm. try again Excuse me. Mm. Okay, could could you go on? So Natasha proposes uh, rather to write question. Everyone mute uh, your mics, please. Okay. I can't speak, but I think there is so much interference between different soundscapes. So I think, uh, like, Ivanka, can you uh, try again, please? Uh, could you enlighten us on the performance space of body and body as, as a category in the context of this so-called theater of the present? Yes. 
the question is uh, written by demon the question is uh, written by demon Okay, I, I didn't get the question. So again, Just the sound are terrible. Just Vivanka, you have echo. Maybe yes. your phone is on and the, it, it interference. So. Mm. Uh, how about now? Can you hear better. me? Much better, yes. Yes. Well, the question is, just a moment. How, uh, could you enlighten us on the performance space and body as a category in the context of this so-called theater of the present? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, the performance space is always the, the present, of course. I mean, you cannot uh, watch theater from the past and, un, unless it's recorded or documented or something like that. So the performance space is the present. That actually makes a dialectical relation between, you know, a time in theater and a time outside theater. But what I'm saying is that the time outside theater is often the very present. Yeah, and uh, but it's in former times, it could be the past as well, and we lost maybe the exploration of the past for this dialectical relation between the time in theater and the time on stage and the time on uh, outside, uh, or like the time on subject matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. But of uh, course, theater in the first place is addressing the present, is addressing the audience for their contemporary uh, ideas for their contemporary feelings and affection. Yeah? So, uh, but what I'm saying with this, you know, that the total occupation with the present is that Müller said, now we live in an age where only the present counts. Yeah? We don't have a future and we relate very rarely to the past. So this, of course, he was exaggerating this a little bit, but he found that with the, the new age of kind of post-Cold War uh, capitalism, uh, the relation to the past would change. Yeah? So for Müller, as a philosopher, it was very important to relate to the debt of the historical past. There is a reason why they are dead or what they thought in their time and you would only have the future in relation to the debt. Yeah? And uh, so what Müller said was like, we give up our debt uh, in order just to live in the present. We want to live only in the present. We don't want to live in the future for what we long for, or we don't want to deal too much with the past because it's difficult and everything is the present only. And so that's an occupation that he said. Like occupation is almost like colonization. We are colonized by our own present. And I think the, the dialectical philosophy behind it is, is that we should be open for the, more open for the past as well as for the future. And uh, of course, like with Corona, maybe we have uh, uh, maybe we have an impulse at least uh, that uh, this makes a historical uh, border, like a frontier. Yeah? So it makes like a, uh, a, a new epoch, a, a new age in time. Uh, so that people now say, oh, it's only three months ago, but it was before Corona. Yeah? So that's already establishing something in the past, that where things were different, things had different conditions, and I think that's already something like a historical thinking, yeah? but uh, bef the critical issue is like that we live only in the present, and Corona may teach us an another lesson. Yeah? Uh, now it's so very simple that you say, okay, this was in the time before Corona, yeah? but already you have something like a, a, a historical 
perspective on that. But getting back to Müller, of course, he said like uh, we need to rework uh, the the worst of history in order to have a future. Yeah? And he thought that was lost. Uh, in the 1990s with the advent of this total capitalism and uh, but you know we all live in different cultures and there's always a past that will get at us yeah so we will have to deal with the past you know be it in Yugoslavia be it in Germany be it in uh, France with their colonial past yeah as it is treated in Castor South and things like that. So I think it's a simplification that we live only in the present, but Müller wants to remind us to deal more, more with just our present, that we look back into the past and that we look forward into the future, what could happen. Yeah? And I think that, uh, that's a, a, a great cause uh, to, to have and, and to work with, also for drama. Mm -hmm. um, Next question is, have we just witnessed the death, the death one, of the aesthetics in the theatre? interested in other languages, yes. Yeah. I think, uh, well, it depends, like, do you mean like the other languages on our stage or translations from other countries or from other cultures? Of course, no. there is a, a, a constant reception of uh, drama from other uh, languages. So we have a certain tradition of translating drama from many countries. Sometimes these are just fashions. There has always been a strong influence from the English-speaking world, but there was also some drama from, like, let's say, Poland at times, and that has been translated and staged successfully. Uh, there was. Uh, always something from Scandinavia, John Fosse. Uh, but I must admit, for the last five years, uh, there was uh, not so much new drama from foreign languages. Yeah? There is, for several reasons, for example, maybe one of the best Russian plays, yeah? Uh, this uh, by Danilov, uh, the Chelovek is Podolska, uh, the man from Podolsk. This has been played in many, many countries all over Europe, but not in Germany. It's been translated uh, because this issue of the uh, uh, individual freedom and the absurdist experience with the police, uh, it does not easily translate into German conditions. But we are aware of this, and I think it's one of the best plays from Russia in, in recent times. Uh, but uh, still, do we? Uh, but there was, I think, there was not so much. We had a heyday of new drama around 2000. This was when a new generation emerged, a whole new generation emerged, and they are still around with us. Uh, like some of them you might know, like the name of René Polish or Moritz Rinke or the Albert Ostermeyer that I mentioned before. Uh, so this was like a whole generation that emerged in the late 90s. Uh, but this phenomenon uh, did not repeat itself, you know, in the last 20 years. So, the, so we have like single phenomena like the Ferdinand Schmalz I recommended to you, but it's not a new uh, book. Thomas Saha, okay. 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 Uh, the next question is uh, what? about what do you think, mm -hmm. do you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, what do you think about the writing of Martin Heckmans and 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 Martin Heckmann, and, yes. and, and well, uh, one of these uh, new playwrights uh, Say again. Martin Heckmans yes. and Ewald Palmetshofer. What? How? Pa Ewald. Oh, Palmetshofer. Yeah. Well, Palmetshofer, again, is like very much in this Austrian tradition. Yeah? 
they are actually more experimental in dramaturgy, they are more experimental in treating of language, and Palmerzhofer has emerged as one of the most important Austrian playwrights uh, uh, next to Ferdinand Schmalz. In fact, he came before Ferdinand Schmalz uh, in terms of time, he emerged before him, and I would count him as one of the eminent figures of contemporary German speaking drama. And Heckmann, uh, whereas uh, uh, Palmetshofer also wrote a play about a deserter in, in World War II. So he is already dealing with something like from the past. Yeah, so he has also uh, rewritten a play by Gerhard Hauptmann. So he has several strategies of, exp of, of literature that are not only just the contemporary play. So Heckmann is interesting for me. He is interesting because he's also trying uh, to write something like comedy in, with the contemporary issues. That's kind of rare, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, he's he's good. I mean, if you get uh, your hands at these plays, uh, you can try it. Okay. The next question is: Hand guess Kaspar language yeah. manipulation politics. Is yeah. it possible to rethink, restage Kaspar in our immediate present day context? dominated by the internet, especially during the corona pandemic and social distancing. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, that's a, already an idea for staging it, you know, that, that, <laughs> that you can use Casper. So Casper, of course, is a, the phenomenon uh, from the very beginning. It was, you know, written in 1966, and it's based on a real case in German history, this Casper Hauser uh, from 19th century. But I think the fundamental structure of Casper is how an isolated individual is being manipulated or somehow influenced by other people uh, or by the structures of language and so on. And of course, it can be there can be a good new interpretation in the context of Corona. I'm I'm absolutely convinced. I saw. Uh, a very good Casper uh, in Poland, where the idea of internet isolation yeah, or isolation by new media was already demonstrated with Casper. And I think, therefore, it's a classic because you can do something in different cultural situations with this text by Hanke. And yeah, I would like to see some Corona Casper. <laughs> uh, I will return to some previous questions. Uh, I hope so. I'm not repeating myself, but the, uh, Natasha is asking according to Fazbit's okay. anti theater, what exactly it's anti drama means in German yeah. contemporary drama? So, according to Fazbinder's anti theater, what exactly anti-drama means in German contemporary drama? Okay, well, this is in, indeed, it, uh, I find that it's repetitive. I already explained. So, anti-theater by Fassbinder was the name of his troupe. Yeah? So, it was, not, it was not so much an aesthetic concept yeah, to begin with. He, he did all kinds of different things. He played this... Uh, 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 Kattelmacher, I don't know the English translation, the, the, the play about the Greek immigrant. Yeah, so uh, they made a new version of Goethe, Tasso, and Iphigenia, things like that. So, so they, their impulse was to change the theater that they had before. Yeah? And, but it was not the destruction of drama. I think there were people like Wolfgang Bauer in Austria, they were much more uh, radical because they wanted to have anti-drama. The uh, tradition of anti-drama uh, came to some extent from the Italian futurists, yeah? the Futuristi. They wanted to have, they wanted to destroy the romantic traditions and culture. And drama, as it came from 19th century, belonged to that 
romantic tradition. They wanted to destroy the drama. And then the late echoes of that, the repercussions, were, were like with Wolfgang Bauer in the 60s. He wanted to uh, uh, destroy the drama as it was. He wrote the so-called micro-dramen, micro-dramatic, and they were short, short pieces. Uh, and there you could see like what the anti-dramatic uh, was. But for today, I would not see such an impulse as to uh, destroy drama or to, you know, create anti-drama. As I said, so people like Frank Kastorf with this recombination aesthetics yeah, and rewriting aesthetics, uh, they create new drama, but not anti-drama. Same as like the special case of René Polish, who writes a new play for each uh, new performance. Now, each new production uh, he writes a new play for, and it cannot be used by other people. It's also a special case of you know non-conventional drama. Yeah? As, uh, it is not allowed to use these texts by other people, other directors, and it would not work because it's written for the situation of these five given actors and in this very theater in that very moment. Uh, so that's, that's you know, what we see with all these examples is like a differentiation of different functions of drama, different functions of drama, a rewriting of tradition, a recombination of tradition, or a complete new writing only for one situation. Uh, and uh, uh, so the impulse of anti-drama, as it was maybe necessary in the 1960s, yeah, to overcome a certain conservatism, uh, it's not necessary for today. Because rather we would have to leave some of the worn out uh, ideas of post-dramatic behind us. Yeah? We have to overcome the post-dramatic because it has become a convention for today. <laughs> the post-dramatic. Yeah? Uh, no dialogue, no real characters, and so on, and so on, and so on. And not everyone uh, you know, treats it in a masterful way. So our problem is not the anti-drama, but to, you know, to use and rediscover the best traditions in drama writing. Therefore, I choose these four very different examples that you can watch in video. Yeah? Like Kastorf for the recombination, uh, Wolfram Lotz for making, he's a good example for overcoming the post-traumatic or for fusing the post-dramatic with other dramatic traditions, yeah? other traditions in drama writing. Then you have Rimini Protocol, who made this demographic documentary piece. It's not even drama. If you would read this, it would be impossible to read, you know, <laughs> because it's only working with these people on stage. Uh, and then there was this uh, fourth example was uh, this uh, Jelinek uh, rewriting ancient Greek myth for contemporary purpose. Yeah, those are four models. Yeah, and I would say uh, maybe the mini protocol is not drama, but I give you this as an example for contemporary uh, theater making. But none of that is sort of in the impulse of anti-drama. They want to renew drama for today, but, but not to destroy because it needs to be destroyed. So that would be my yes. honest question, uh, honest answer to that. Yes. Uh, the next question is okay. uh, related. Okay. My question is related to theater tourism. And yes. this pandemic has affected tourism and the ah, stage performances so in yeah. abroad. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this will restrict cultural exchange through theater? And how theater artists would like to find solution for this limitation in current, current scenario? Okay. Well, see, there, of course, there will be uh, less tourism also for theater or for the certain branches of theater. I would say uh, to some extent, theater is being thrown back to become a very local uh, 
phenomenon, a, a very local institution for local people, for the people who live there, who go there, and the tourism uh, will not, uh, maybe for the time being, will not be as big as it used to be, yeah? but it will return very soon. But what we don't know, and I was talking about that yesterday, is like this whole distance rules and the reduced seating, what that will mean for the future of theater. Yeah? It will also restrict admission to theater that not so many people can go there anymore. Yeah? And that might also affect the, the tourism in theater. I give you another example, more concrete, like the biggest palace uh, for you know, uh, Varité Theater in Berlin. It's like Friedrich Stadtpalast. It's like for 2,000 people. Yeah. It, of course, it's also closed and cannot be reopened soon. So they use the time for renovation. And I think that's the, the, the largest theater in Berlin, which probably has a share of up to 80% of, of people from outside Berlin yeah, for tourism. It's almost like Broadway. Yeah? Broadway also of people who visit New York and want to uh, go there in theater. So this you know, big business tourism uh, will wait maybe the longest to return uh, in full scale. Uh, but the smaller tourism and theater will return very soon, I suppose. Um, uh, once uh, Romit Roy is asking once again, how about Handkes again? Publicums besichim yes. punk. I'm sorry, have I pronounced it uh, clearly? You understand? Yeah, Publicums yeah. besichim punk. Yes. How what about that? Uh, just a moment. That was the question. How about Handkes? Okay. Publicums well, Beschimpfung. Well, it, this play from 1966 actually marks the beginning of post dramatic in German literature. Yes, yeah, in the context of anti drama, she added. Oh, in, in the, the context. context. Well, it, it was his breakthrough. It mm -hmm. was the first German play without characters and without action. Yeah. So it's a, it's a landmark. It's like a landmark. It cannot be repeated that way. He was just the first to do that. And uh, the last important play, well, then, of course, he went through uh, several phases. So the offending the audience, Publikumsbeschimpfung, was also the beginning <coughs> of, a, of a number of plays that were called the speech plays. Yeah, these plays were basically concerned with the structures of language, as it was with Caspar, as it was with offending the audience. There are also some silent plays, pantomimes, things like that. They are called the speech plays, or they are uh, also plays about the speech pattern. So this was early experimentalism in Hanke. Then in the 70s, he changed, then he took a long break uh, of almost writing nothing for theater for almost 10 years. And then he returned with a play. It was called uh, uh, Über die Dörfer, uh, around the, um, it's, it's like a proverbial saying. It's like uh, across, across the country, maybe. Yes, so Über die Dörfer. And uh, it was then he started with an oratory style, but he had like real characters, he had some real action. Uh, he created his own mythologies. Yeah? His own mythologies. Usually it was like uh, uh, very often you find uh, it, it comes very much from the romantic tradition in Handke that you find a certain sphere of peacefulness that is en endangered by invaders. Yeah? So it's like almost like the war situation or the war experience. So you live in a sort of golden uh, paradise and it's being destroyed by outer forces. So, but often in a fairy tale style. Then uh, there's another, uh, another phase could start with sort of autobiographical material. Yeah? 
uh, which is the most important is the Storm Still play. The Storm Still is about his Slovenian family. And it's very, very important to understand the whole complex of uh, Austria, Germany and Yugoslavia in Hanke's work. And so I would call this autobiographical play. Yeah? And there's a new one coming out this summer. And it's about, uh, I think it's about the, uh, a similar case, like Jan Palach was in, in Prague in 1968, the guy who burned himself in public. Yeah, so the self-sacrifice for a noble cause, for a noble cause of protest. So in Prague, 1968, during the Soviet invasion, this man, this young man, uh, uh, died the death of uh, self-inflammation. And I think he's, uh, Handke found another case like this and is treating this. So it's basically historical material. Yeah. Then there's another play, it's just a man and a woman, it's like kind of relationship material, yeah? so it's called, what is it called? I need to, uh, uh, what is mm. You would have to look it up. It was as a play after Storm Storm. Uh, but I think Hanke, to make a very general statement of appreciation, Handke has written drama for more than 50 years now and has never repeated himself. So each play was a new idea of drama. Each play was a new idea of dramaturgy. Yeah? And I think that alone makes him very, very special. Yeah? So there is no repetition and formula in his work, beginning with offending the audience and has not come to an end yet. And I think that is very, very unique. Yeah? So look at Ibsen, for example. In Ibsen, you can see a model that is being used again and again. Yeah? So the model is there's a certain group of people in crisis and then somebody from outside comes with a secret from the past and everything uh, breaks down, <laughs> becomes very problematic. So Ibsen is using one model and repeats it. Yeah? But Handke has never repeated one model. And that makes him so special. By the way, he sees himself drama not as his main field. He says he is a, a poet in prose writing. And but drama is something that he does uh, as an additional activity as a writer. But he sees uh, his main uh, field in prose writing, poetical prose writing. But I would say uh, he has uh, an achievement as great as it is in prose writing, also in the uh, creation of drama, mm -hmm. of new drama. Yes. And uh, for a long time. It was, you know, during the, when, when Hanke was seen as, you know, the, there was a lot of bashing Hanke uh, repeated uh, with the Nobel Prize uh, in last year that there was the discussion about Hanke as being uh, the post-Serbian uh, propagandist and stuff like that. But that will diminish this will disappear and fade out very soon again. And uh, so his work as a writer is uh, much more important than the debate about his uh, uh, ideas about Yugoslavia, exactly. whereby I believe he has good reasons to, uh, to have suffered with the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, yeah? So, but uh, I would really recommend to follow his work over the whole course of 50 years, and you will find uh, no other playwright that has been so creative in finding new methods and forms. Yeah? Great. Uh, Thomas, please tell me uh, another question is, um, uh, besides German and British uh, theater authors, 
uh, does German th is German theater interested in other languages, uh, playwrights, I, countries? Do you translate I, them and stage them? I tried to explain it uh, before. Of course, there are there's the great nations of literature, like, uh, of course, there's a, there was even a rediscovery of the American playwright to some extent. British playwriting is not so present because it's, uh, you know, like, and then, of course, there's Chekhov and uh, the Russian tradition. What you see is like uh, what ha maybe has become more of a problem is our theater culture is really, really uh, based on directors' energy and creativity. Yeah? So directors, therefore, directors also have become like cast of their own authors, like cast of and Polish and Matala. So Matala is the same. He also creates his own his own drama for himself. So it's, it's, it's compositions of their own and. Uh, so as this theater culture is so much based on directors' ideas and as a sort of the center of creative process, uh, new drama maybe has also become a little bit underappreciated, even though we still have this enormous production of 100 new plays per season, uh, the appreciation of new drama is not in that size. Yeah? And often you have the case that uh, uh, that even for the Uraufführung, for the world premiere, for the first premiere, directors change the text of, of the new play. Yeah? Yes. And of course the, the playwrights hate that. They think that's uh, a signal of this underappreciation, that the playwright is not at the center but the director. Yeah? And there's still the debate going on. And to answer that question now uh, is that I think that the share of foreign plays maybe has become a little less in the last five to seven years. It's my impression. I have no statistics for that. But, but there's still, well, for the British playwrights, I already said that, that, uh, 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 that they are not so present, but at the same time, uh, Simon Stevens is the most appreciated British playwright for years, yeah? and he uh, he's not only staged once, but his plays are produced in the major big theaters in Vienna and Berlin and Hamburg and Zurich and so on. So there's uh, Simon Stevens maybe is even the representative of new British drama, but if we speak about let's look into the uh, uh, Central Eastern European countries and their playwrights, there was very little in recent years. Yeah, so there is nothing, almost nothing from Poland. There is almost nothing from Czech and Slovak theater. There is very, very few people uh, from, let's say, contemporary Hungarian drama that used to be very strong. Uh, there are other areas in culture, like for Poland and Hungary, it's more the film. The film culture is very interesting, but uh, there is no, uh, the German theater is not receptive for the drama. So I don't know if that is a sufficient answer. I think it's not the situation that we're totally ignorant, mm -hmm. but it's not, uh, it's not a time of enthusiasm for new drama from abroad either. Yeah. So this is how I would describe the situation. Yeah? And in fact, there was very little. I mentioned the men from Podolsk uh, from Russian drama. So there is still uh, a good share or like some attention for new Russian drama, but for the smaller theater nations in Eastern Europe. Uh, it needs like something like a new leading figure. It would be the same would be true for the Baltic uh, republics or you know things like that. At the moment, and this might be this might deteriorate even like with the Corona crisis. There is not so much interested interest for new voices from abroad, especially not from Eastern Europe. I understand. 
Thomas, I have the very last question. Yeah. Uh, my apologies. Uh, uh, I receive a note that I have repeat one uh, question. My apologies for that. But the last mm -hmm. question is by a guest, and it sounds like this: What is the current confection between politics and theater? Uba mm -hmm. Die Dorfe was directed by Wim Wenders, yes. who will direct this year's production of Handke in Festival of Salzburg this summer. Okay. And what is the current connection between politics and theater? Okay, this is two totally different questions. <laughs> yes, but from one person. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, well, first, the director for the new play by Peter Handke in Salzburg will be Friederike Heller. Friederike Heller. Uh, she has done a number of Handke plays before. Yeah? She has done a number of Handke plays before uh, in Vienna, and uh, she had worked with a band, with a uh, rock band, for example. And uh, it may be very good for the musicality in his language. And, and so I think it was certainly in arrangement with Handke himself that she was chosen to uh, direct the new play and that book. And uh, I will wait a moment. I, I will give you, I will show you uh, the title of the play that you get it correct. Okay. The title of the play is Zenek Adamek. Can you see it? Yes. Is it visible? It says Zenek Adamek is this one person I was speaking about. And uh, uh, it just says one scene. So, but it might be the historical material and we don't know yet. But I'm, I'm very uh, curious to see it and to read it. The text is not available yet. And this, the connection between drama and politics, uh, is, uh, is, it cannot be answered in one sentence. Yeah? I gave you this monologue by uh, uh, Wolfram Lott, yeah, the, the Politiker. You might take that as the answer. If you read a little bit in German, yeah? and because, of course, here you have that the politicians are so a relevant public category. <laughs> yeah? Therefore, it's called the politiker. Then you see they can be subject of uh, a play, of a monologue even. And But you also have the absurdist element in this text. The absurdist element. Uh, so there is a relation of alienation between politics and theater that you can find in this one single text by a rather young playwright. And I think that can describe the relation as it is. Yeah? I would say, like the last generation, like Dirk Lauke, the, uh, that I was talking about with new social drama. So this generation, they are interested in politics. Yeah? They are interested in politics, but they don't identify with it. So this makes the distance. This makes the alienation distance. Yeah? So and maybe in former times, like people like Brecht and maybe even Heiner Müller, they still identified with certain areas of politics. Yeah? So today, people do not identify with politics anymore, but they are not depoliticized uh, by that. So they have an interest in politics but they don't identify with it. Maybe it's the way, it's a first approach how to say it. Uh, Thomas, um, okay, uh, I haven't received any questions. Okay. Uh, I was very careful to return to some previous and to ask them, right. uh, to read them to you. And uh, I hope so you're tired and maybe slowly we can close and uh, I also have questions but I will keep them for our interview for theater times I remember you agree at the beginning of this year yeah, yeah. and uh, because of corona and some other obligation everything was just postponed and 
I would like just to thank you very much for uh, this high quality of lecture and uh, given answers to all our all our questions. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. I hope so. Our colleagues are satisfied and I hope so. My apologies for the technical interruption somewhere in between and the echo. It is uh, beyond my control. It was beyond my control. No, no, it no. is just a bad weather, you know, issue. You were, thank you. You were a great host for this. Because thank you. Because you organized this and, you know, you were like the, the headmaster of the talk show in a way. Really? <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, thank you so, Ivanka, on behalf of uh, all the participants, I would like to thank uh, Thomas Irma and also you for organizing such a wonderful, insightful program. And we are actually looking forward to that interview in the Theatre Times. Thank no? you very Theater much. Times. Thank yeah, you yeah. Much. Thanks. Well, somebody uh, Thomas, do you have a website? But, uh, written questions afterwards. Yeah, you, you can follow up and I will answer in short. I will answer. And my, main, yeah. my main idea or purpose is uh, to give you uh, maybe a hint what to follow and where to go. Okay? All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yes, Thomas, of course. Uh, uh, I will write uh, um, to all participants, I will write again if they have some additional question and I will okay. send it to you and. Uh, uh, anyhow, for everything else, we keep in contact. We are uh, recording all your lectures. After editing, we can uh, publish them and uh, share with the audience, uh, particularly for the names. P people are asking once again for the playwrights and their names. So everything will be recorded, actually, and they can mm -hmm. uh, just refer to your uh, recorded lectures. Okay, good. So, to thank you to all the participants. And I will take time tonight yeah, to answer your questions. So I will make time for tonight uh, to uh, answer your questions. Best like that you use this, uh, you know, the text, uh, the text window in Skype that I can. And then I will give you more information. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. See you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everybody. Hope to meet you in real. <laughs> I hope this. so too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. I wish you all the best and keep in contact. I'm going to send you the link after we publish the recorded videos. And please, uh, uh, during this day, you can send me uh, questions and I can resend them to Mr. Thomas and return you back his answers if you agree thank you he's sure. available sure thank so you, keep in contact yes thank you too bye bye <laughs>